Hello everyone and welcome to our Cypress and Mouser co-sponsored Cypress Sensing Technologies Virtual Training Workshop. Today we'll be talking to you about our CapSense Capacitive Sensing and MagSense Inductive Sensing Sensing Technologies. My name is Michiyuki Oneda. I am a staff product marketing engineer here at Cypress and I look after our PSOC MCUs. I'm Brendan McAndrews. I'm an applications engineer from the same PSOC MCU business unit and later on I will be giving a demonstration on how to get started with our MagSense technologies, but for now I'll leave it with Michiyuki. Thank you, Brendan. So before I jump right in, there's a few things that I wanted to remind you guys of. There is a hands-on portion to this webinar, so please download the PDF manual that comes on the uh, bottom left corner of your console. Also, uh, there is a QA chat box, so if you have any questions during the webinar or during the hands-on lab, please feel free to put, your, put in and type in your questions in that QA chat box, and we will address them after the webinar is done. Uh, moving forward, I'm just going to quickly run through the agenda of, of today's webinar. So first, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Cypress, our company, and some of the innovations that we have created throughout, the, throughout our years. Um, I'll jump right into a comparison of CapSense and MagSense. And then we'll have Brendan come back on camera and walk, walk you guys through a, a couple labs using our MagSense inductive sensing technologies. After his labs are done, I'll jump back right in to talk about our MCU PSOC MCU roadmaps and also how to get started with our CapSense and MagSense technologies. So just to give you guys an overview of who, who we are and what we do, uh, we are a company uh, that creates semiconductors and we have a bunch of different products in our memories, wireless technologies, microcontrollers, uh, flash, and those kinds of things. And, a lot, and some, some of the target markets that we do uh, target today is automotive, consumer, industrial, and also the Internet of Things, which is the hot topic of today. Um, some of the key innovations that we do have in our portfolios, again, it's our wireless technologies. We do have Wi-Fi chips, Bluetooth chips. We also do have the combination of a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip. We are also heavily focused on security. So a lot of our, a lot of devices today are connecting to the internet and to the internet of things. So it does require some kind of security to keep your data private. Um, another innovation that we do have is our programmability within our PSOC microcontrollers on our analog side and also on the digital side of things. But today the main focus will be on our CapSense capacitive sensing solutions and also our MagSense Mag inductive sensing solutions as well. So just to give you guys a quick overview of our PSOC microcontrollers, and the reason why I'm going to cover our PSOC microcontrollers first is that our CapSense and our MagSense sensing technologies actually reside in the hardware of our PSOC MCUs. So what you'll generally, generally see with our PSOC MCUs is some kind of ARM Cortex uh, core. So it could be an M0+, plus, it could be an M0. We do have some dual core devices today that, are, that support an M4 floating point unit core and a M0+. Plus. And then you have your standard basic system resources like memories and communication interfaces. And what makes, us, what makes our PSOC microcontrollers very unique is the programmability that we do have on the analog side of things and also on the digital side of things. So if you take a look at this block diagram that I do have here, we have you know, in, integrated op amps, we have integrated SAR ADCs and DACs on the programmable analog side. And we also do have some programmable digital things like UDBs or universal digital blocks and also TC PWMs or timer counter PWM blocks. So touching back on some of the programmable analog that we do have, we do have a block within our PSOC MCUs called a CTB or a continuous time block. And what, these, what those blocks are basically are is an op amp with some resistor arrays. So for example, you could create a programmable gain amplifier using that block. Um, on the digital side of things with our programmability, I mentioned universal digital blocks or UDBs earlier. So these are pretty much what they are, are two PLDs. So you can create simple glue logic, you could write your own Verilog, create your lookup tables or state machines using these UDBs. In addition, you can also create some custom interfaces as well if you wanted to uh, using these UDB blocks. Another programmable digital block that we do have is our SCBs, or our serial communication blocks. And these are blocks where you can configure them to be an I2C communication interface, SPI, or UART. So with our PSOC microcontrollers, it's not just about CapSense capacitive sensing and MagSense inductive sensing, but we do provide other key resources in our chips so that you can integrate external components on your board or you can reduce your bomb costs on your board. So we're, what we're trying to do with our PSOC microcontrollers here is to make your systems smarter, make them more connected, make them easy to use, and also make them secure. So I'm going to run through a few of the 
key technologies, again, in our PSOC MCU. So our CapSense and MagSense are these hardware blocks in our PSOC MCUs. We're the industry leaders in CapSense and MagSense as well. So things like standard buttons and sliders for touch functionality or metal detection, um, proximity sensing, and also liquid level sensing are some of the key technologies and applications that our PSOC MCUs can provide. I touched on some of the programmable analog and digital side resources of our MCUs. So again, with our programmable analog blocks, since we do have some integrated op amps and some ADCs and things like that, you can create your own custom AFEs or your analog front ends to interface with analog sensors there. With our programmable digital side, again, I covered uh, UDBs or universal digital blocks where you can create your own custom glue logic or you can create your own custom interfaces. Um, touching on some of our wired and wireless connectivity features within our chips, we do provide some wired support with full speed USB and CAN. And then on the wireless connectivity side, we do have built in Bluetooth low energy, low energy radio PSOC MCUs as well with our PSOC 4s and our PSOC 6 portfolios. And for the uh, Bluetooth low energy type, uh, we support 4.2 and also 5.0. And then lastly, on the security side of things, we do provide hardware based and software based security features in our PSOC microcontrollers so that when you're connecting to the internet for a lot of your IoT devices, your, your data is private and it's not hacked. So giving you guys a history of our capacitive inductive sensing technologies. So we started way back in 2000, early, the early 2000s with our PSOC 1 devices. And with our PSOC 1 devices, we supported our very first generation CapSense capacitive sensing technology. And one of our very first design wins was our LG chocolate phone. So if you look closely on the picture here, you'll see that the, the keypad and the, uh, the, the trackpad on there is our, using our CapSense technologies. And then as we went along the years and we learned, we learned a lot more and became more experienced, we realized that a lot of these applications, specifically in the consumer and automotive sides, required some kind of liquid tolerance. So if there's some kind of water or some kind of liquid on your touch button, it would falsely trigger. So we came up with a technology where you can prevent that from happening with our liquid tolerance. And then moving forward, we did hear demands from the field and from our customers that you know, tuning is not easy. So tuning a capacitive or inductive sensing system, it, it can be difficult at times. And that could be due to the hardware side of things, that could be due to the software side of things. So what we've done with our CapSense technologies and our MagSense technologies is we provided a smart sense algorithm which would auto-tune your sensor system to be optimal in any kind of environment. So if there's any type of you know, dry or wet conditions or uh, noisy, uh, less noisy conditions, those types of extreme conditions, our smart sense algorithm will auto-compensate for any kind of variations that your sensor system may be in. And then back in 2013, this is, this is where we shipped our uh, first billion unit uh, of our PSOC MCUs with CapSense inside. Um, and then after that, uh, back in the late 2016 area, we came up with our PSOC 4S series. And what's unique about this one is that we've actually integrated self-capacitive sensing and mutual capacitive sensing on one chip. So everything before our 2016 timeframe, it was all based on self-capacitive sensing. But then we realized that, hey, we, with our CapSense hardware block, we can do mutual capacitive sensing as well. And I'll touch on mutual capacitive sensing a, a little bit later. And then last year in the summertime, we also introduced our MagSense inductive sensing here. And we took all the know-how and all the experience that we've gained with our CapSense technologies, and we've integrated all of that knowledge into our inductive sensing MagSense technologies as well. So just kind of touching on some new features that we are enabling with our CapSense and MagSense technologies. So we, are, we do have chips today that can support both CapSense and MagSense technologies. And we're gonna be calling this technology Sense. So with Sense, you will be able to do CapSense and MagSense all on one chip. So if you do, do require some kind of capacitive sensing technology and inductive sensing technology, um, Sense will be the way to go. And this will be supported in our PSOC 4700 family initially. And then we will broaden that out to our other PSOC 4 families and our PSOC 6 families as well. Now getting into some of the technology behind the and some theory behind CapSense and MagSense, 
I'm going to be talking to you briefly about how CapSense works and also how MagSense works within our PSOC MCUs. So with capacitive sensing, what, what happens is we're, we're detecting the change in electric fields here. So whether it be self-capacitive or mutual capacitive, we are, what we're doing is we're detecting the change in electric, electric fields when a finger comes and approaches the sensor. And with, with self-capacitive sensing, we do have our CapSense CSD blocks, CSD methodology in our CapSense technology. And what this is, is you know, self-capacitive sensing, it occurs when there's one node of the capacitor is sensed, and then the second node of the capacitor is fixed potentially. So as a finger approaches the sensor, and usually these sensors will be PCB copper-based sensors, you're adding to the overall capacitance of that sensor. And then what we're doing within our chip is we're digitizing that capacitance into raw counts. And that's where a user would then use those raw counts to tune and optimize their system for the best performance. So just a keynote here for self-capacitive sensing. So when the finger may appear grounded because there's a large capacitance between the human body and Earth. Now moving on to the capacitive touch sensing mutual, mutual cap side of things, or what we call CapSense CSX. How this works is there's a mutual capacitive sensing that occurs when there is access to both nodes of a capacitor. So there's usually a transmit node and there's a receiver node. What you're doing is you're driving your sensor using the transmit node, and then whatever signals are coming out, you are receiving on the receiver node. So I guess the key note here is that when a finger approaches the sensor, again, it could be a PCB FR4 copper-based sensor, you're actually decreasing the mutual capacitance when a touch is applied, while self-capacitance will increase the touch when a touch is applied. Now jumping into mag, uh, MagSense inductive sensing, so what we're doing here is we're detecting the change in magnetic fields. So what we do is we drive an AC signal into an inductive coil, which creates a magnetic field. And then as a, some kind of metal target or some kind of deflection of metal happens, uh, what we're doing is we're increasing the eddy, we're inducing eddy currents and, and from the target, and then we're changing that magnetic field. So with our MagSense inductive sensing, what, what happens is that the sensor forms a parallel LC tank, which excites the resonant frequency, and the resulting signal is coupled into an RX or receive channel through a capacitor. So just some key notes on MagSense inductive sensing. So inductive sensing, again here, it detects the change in magnetic field, while CapSense capacitive sensing detects the change in electric field. And this is just a quick summary of how you know, the self-capacitive sensing works, how the mutual capacitive sensing works, and how inductive sensing works within our chips. Again, the key, the key thing here is electric fields versus magnetic fields. Now moving on to some use cases for CapSense. So again, you have your standard CapSense buttons and sliders or radio sliders. If, for example, the very first iPod, that is a radio slider that used capacitive sensing. And that is one key use case that we have for CapSense technologies. Again, uh, cars today have a center console area below the gear shifter that have a trackpad on there. So you can use CapSense for trackpad functionality and also for a unique feature like proximity detection where you could potentially re replace an IR sensor and use just a copper wire and detect a certain amount of distance using capacitive sensing. And what this enables or what, what values this adds are that you can replace that IR sensor so you can decrease the bomb cost of your system in addition to having more lower power versus an IR sensor. Another cool kind of unique application we do have today is capacitive liquid level sensing. So imagine a slider on the side of a bottle, and instead of a finger moving up that slider, it's going to be water. So what we're doing there is pretty much the same thing, a finger on a slider, but it's just a water or some kind of liquid on the slider. And we can actually accurately detect where the level of a liquid is using our CapSense technologies there. Another thing that we're seeing lately is with smartphones and specifically the European market. So there is a standard for specific absorption rate. And what this is, is the amount of radiation the human body absorbs when, they, when a cell phone approaches you. So we can use proximity CapSense sensing here to kind of detect that distance and then change, change the power levels of a cell phone, for example, so that a human is exposed to less radiation. Moving on to uh, force sensing uh, is another application that you can 
apply with CAPS and its capacitive sensing. So a lot of wearables today, smartphones today, have some kind of uh, pressure or some force applied features as well. And once you've done that, it, it feeds back to some kind of haptics motor or some kind of motor to give users some feedback that yes, the button was pressed or the touchscreen was pressed. So force sensing is another application that our CapSense technologies can do. And then what we're seeing in the automotive side of things is absolute capacitive sensing as well. Now moving on to some MagSense use cases. Again, I mentioned that it's what's really important here is the, the, the deflection between a metal overlay or some kind of metal target and the sensor coil on the PCB. So as you can see here, there's a MagSense metal button here. So this is a metal overlay, metal overlay keypad. So under this metal overlay, you'll see the sensor coils, maybe on a PCB or an F, uh, FPC or a flexible printed circuit. Um, there are use cases for proximity as well. So you can do proximity sensing as well using MagSense inductive sensing. Kind of, same kind of theory, but you're just upping the sensitivity on the coil, and then when some kind of metal target approaches, you're, you're emitting some super sensitive magnetic field so you can detect that change in the magnetic field. Another use case or application would be rotary encoders. So a lot of home appliances today, for example, washing machines, maybe even microwaves, and those kinds of things are using a traditional mechanical dial. And they're susceptible to environmental changes, things like liquids, dust, um, those types of things. And what you can do here is you could replace those mechanical dials with just a PCB or FPC and draw or create a encoder type sensor coil design. And then on top of that, put some kind of metal target so that you can actually see the encoder functionality um, and replace that kind of traditional old mechanical dial using MagSense rotary encoder functionality. Uh, moving on, we can also do some MagSense linear transducers, and we are also looking into MagSense flow meters as well here. Now, some of the CapSense and MagSense comparisons and some, some of the pros and cons I wanted to cover as well, just to summarize for you all. So with CapSense capacitive sensing, some of the key advantages here is the hybrid sensing. So I mentioned mutual and self-capacitive sensing. So if you, if you have both technologies, you can enable advanced features like glove touch, proximity, hover, um, liquid tolerance. And another cool thing is also wet finger tracking. So what you could potentially do is use self-capacitive sensing to detect a liquid. And then with that liquid on the sensor, you can use mutual capacitive to detect you know, the finger touch. So that's another cool feature that we do have with our PSOC MCUs and our CapSense technologies. You can do more than, uh, more than two touches. So because we have the mutual capacitive sensing capabilities, you, we could control ITO screens, for example, or indium tin oxide screens. We can do more than uh, two touches. So up to 10 touches is something that we, we are able to do. It is also a, enables a low cost system. So a lot of these cap sense systems are just basic PCBs with copper. So all you really need to do is design a circular sensor or square sensor or those types of sensors and just put it on a PCB. And lastly, it's easy to use. So we've made our CapSense technologies easy to use, meaning that within our PSOC Creator ID, which Brendan will be covering later on, there's an easy to use tuner, there's an easy to use widget editor where you can drag and drop your buttons and set and easily tune your system to be optimal. Um, now, touching on some of the cons or the disadvantages of CapSense, it's, again, it's not fully waterproof, so meaning it's just a liquid tolerance. So if there is a liquid on a capacitive sensor, what we do is we reject those touches, and once we reject those touches, you, cannot, you will not be able to touch the button again until the water is, or liquid is off that sensor. Um, another thing is that it's easily affected by the environment and the surroundings, so temperature, moisture, liquids, those types of things are easily affecting capacitive sensing. And sometimes tuning can be difficult when using capacitive sensing. Um, so things on the MagSense inductive side of things, uh, some of the key advantages here. So it provides robustness and reliability in harsh environments and surroundings. So I talked about things like dust and liquids and those types of things, or just mechanical buttons just failing. Um, MagSense does provide robustness and reliability in those types of surroundings. Again, you can enable a fully waterproof system so the key thing with inductive sensing is the metal deflection between a piece of metal and the sensor coil, and there's a change in magnetic field. 
So you can actually f create a fully waterproof system and still have a button type functionality in water. And you could use that button when it's also submerged in water. A good example would be the uh, Fitbit Charge 3. So with the Fitbit Charge 3, there is an inductive button on there. And you can actually use that water, you can use that wearable in water. And the key, th key thing there is that there is an, there's an inductive coil, and then there's also a metal target or metal overlay above that. So it's sensing that deflection, and water and liquids will not affect the performance of that button. Again, you can do proximity sensing and glove touch as well, and it's also a reliable force sensing technology to use as well. Now, some of the cons with MagSense inductive sensing, the hardware design can be complex, and also it does result in lower yield. And also the, 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 the key thing here is that tuning can be difficult. But what we've done here at Cypress is that we've created design guides, we've created the SmartSense algorithms, we have our own auto calibration and auto tuning algorithms where we can compensate any type of, again, harsh environmental changes or manufacturing variations with your PCB. So we have supplied and enabled our customers to create their optimal sensor designs using our MagSense and our CapSense technologies. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Brendan who will jump right into the hands-on lab. And specifically today, the hands-on lab will be about the MagSense inductive sensing. All right, so we're gonna jump onto a hands-on portion. Um, before we get started with these labs, you will need a special inductive sensing kit. This kit for us is the CY8C kit 148 which we have down in this corner. Um, as you can see, it's got three buttons and then one large proximity sensor in the middle. Um, we will also be using a second kit called the CY8C kit 148-coil. And this is another inductive sensing kit that we've got uh, down here in this corner. And this one, as you can see, has uh, a few different types of inductive sensors on it, uh, but each one demonstrates a different functionality and we'll be sticking with the one uh, with the big yellow dial on it that's gonna act as our rotary encoder for uh, this demo. So now if you go back to our screen, you can see we have the MagSense lab manual up. Um, this is downloadable in the resources menu for this VTW. It covers all of the stuff that I will be talking about during this lab in a good bit of depth. Pretty much everything you would ever need to know for getting started with fairly simple coils is covered in here, including small sections with questions about uh, questions for you as the user to answer to show how you would appropriately tune a uh, inductive sensing coil. So now we're going to jump back into the actual PSOC Creator project. So if you've worked with PSOC before, you probably used the PSOC Creator platform. And if so, you might be familiar with the, the workflow, but we're gonna go ahead and get started with a, a brand new project here. So I'm gonna just go to my workspace. We're gonna do a file new project. And this is just to kind of go over how easy it is to get started with inductive sensing. I will also be covering um, more of the tuning flow as well. But in this case, like I just said, we need the CY8C kit 148. That's the first pull down menu for me on PSOC Creator. We'll go ahead and select next. We need an empty schematic. Doesn't really matter what the design name is here, but we'll go ahead and call it, uh, how about MagSense 1? All right. So now that you've got your blank workspace, uh, getting started with inductive sensing is about as easy as it is getting started with anything else in Cypress, it might actually be easier because there's not too much software involvement. So you're gonna click go ahead and in your project that you just created, so in my case, MagSense 1, I will select the top design schematic and we make sure that that is the active window right here. It should just be an empty white space. We're gonna go ahead and look through the component catalog for the MagSense component. And for me, comes up right away. We've got version 6.0 right here. So we'll go ahead and just drag that into our workspace. And once you've done that, you basically have brought in all of the underlying uh, firmware and configuration that you need to get working with MagSense. There's quite a bit more that we'll go over in just a moment. But basically all you need to do is bring in that first block. Um, to use the 
inductive sensing or the sense tuner at all with inductive sensing as well as with uh, capacitive sensing, you need the EZI2C component. And this should come up when I search it right here. We're going to go ahead and use the SCB mode V4 component. And once again, we're just dragging and dropping that into our workspace. And that's kind of all we need to get going component-wise. There's going to be some uh, other steps we need to do in the firmware files later on, but for now we'll just go straight into configuration. So for MagSense, we just go ahead and rename this guy to MagSense. We don't really need any numbers there. And as I showed on the kit earlier, we have three buttons and one proximity coil. And to add a widget, which is what we use to call our coils in the MagSense component, we can just press this plus button right here, and in this case we need three buttons, so button zero, button one, and button two, and one proximity sensor. And we won't worry about the other tabs for now, but that is kind of all we need um, on the widget side of things. And then for the Easy I2C component, I'm going to go ahead and rename this just Easy I2C, and I'm going to switch the data rate to 400 and our sub-address size to 16 bits. And I'll explain why we did that in a bit, but for now, just trust me, you're going to need to do this. Otherwise, you might need to change some settings in your inductive sensing tuner. So go ahead and click Apply. OK to close that window. And then back to the MagSense block. So we have our three buttons and our one proximity widget here. We can now go to the Advanced um, and Widget Details, or um, ISX settings, I guess, for now. And the ISX setting, uh, we are going to go ahead and set to 48,000. Oh, but some reason that doesn't come up. So what we actually need to do to make sure that we can run at 48 megahertz or 48,000 kilohertz in the configuration window is go back to our project overview and select our clocks tab over on the left. And we can go and edit the clock. Go to your High Frequencies Clock tab and select 48 under the IMO. And that'll enable us to run our MagSense at the fastest possible scan rate. So back into Advanced, ISX Settings, and 48 megahertz, and we are good to go. So go ahead and hit Apply once you've made the change to 48 megahertz. And uh, yeah, so real quickly, what we did there is we brought in our MagSense block, we set up our widgets, we brought in our Easy I2C block to connect to the tuner, and then we configured that to have some tuner configurations. Um, but specifically with the ISX settings, inductive sensing uses two clocks. Um, one, well, it uses only one clock, but it uses a, a counting technique where one clock controls the number of constant scans, and another clock will can control the number of samples uh, that actually get converted per second from the MagSense received signal. Um, for now, we're going to go ahead and leave the auto calibration enabled here. Jump back to our widget details. You can just verify really quickly that none of these parameters are changed. So if you are following along and you have brought in your three buttons and your proximity sensor, you can see in your widget hardware parameters that they are probably all of the same as mine. In the scan order, this is another configurable parameter in the MagSense component. Basically, you can choose which one of these has the highest priority, um, which one of the widgets you would like to be scanning the most frequently or have conversions and data ready from uh, first in the priority queue. In this case, we're not too concerned with that, so we will go ahead and just leave it in the default configuration. So select OK. And now we've got the one last thing to do. Uh, and that is get our firmware started. So we have the blocks brought in, but we don't have any configuration set up in code. So we go ahead and open our main.c file. So that's, again, in the project directory in the Workspace Explorer. Just go to your source files, main.c, and you will see it's got some default stuff. It includes project.h, and that basically includes all of the generated source and all of the configuration files you need to actually use the APIs from our components. Then we enable global interrupts, and we don't do anything else. We've got an empty for loop here, so we might want to do something with that. And with inductive sensing, what that's going to be is a constant 
scan for ready widgets or widgets that have data that need to be processed. So it's pretty easy to get started. Um, we can actually jump back to the top design level here and right click our MagSense component and you'll see it's got this open data sheet tab that pops up. We're going to go ahead and do that really quickly and uh, there's a quick start section but we care about the MagSense tuner section. This kind of is a nice easy functionality, easy access for our documentation on any component. You can right click and open the data sheet just like that. In most cases we'll have all the information you need to get started within the data sheet more application level specific stuff will be available in app notes or code examples on the web. But basically, we just want this chunk of code from step three in the MagSense tuner guide. This code is also available in the uh, lab manual if you're following along in the lab manual for this particular lab. This is the buttons and proximity, se uh, proximity sensor section of the lab. So if you can jump there, you'll find the same section of code with a little bit of explanation about each line that I will cover right now. So go ahead and copy and paste this into your main.c file back in the workspace. And it's going to be pretty ugly because you're copying and pasting from a PDF. So we're going to take a second and uh, tab this and indent it properly. Uh, nobody really wants to look at code that looks like this. So put all these spaces in here. All right. And sorry if this takes just a second, but nobody really wants to look at code that looks like this. So we will do that and tab everything in. everything except for that last tab. Tab, tab, and we're good. Okay, so now that we've got things formatted a little more readably, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through what each one of the, the function calls does here in this main.c file. So obviously I just kind of went over briefly what the include project.h is. And right now we have a little warning saying that this file is not found. We need to build the project to generate the missing file. Um, we will build it and it will get generated. So that warning will go away. Basically the project.h again just includes everything uh, from our component selection, our pins configurations, our clocks and, and whatnot to bring into the uh, main.c library that you're going to be working with. The very first thing we do outside of the normal stuff is we call easy I2C start. That's pretty straightforward. That just starts our communication component so that we can sync with the tuner. We then have a call to this easy I2C set buffer one. This basically sets the data buffer from our easy I2C component to be sourced from our MagSense data structure that we store in RAM. And this MagSense data structure in RAM is a structure that controls all of the input signals as well as component parameters. Um, and you can go ahead and right click and go to definition if you would like to learn more about that particular data structure. Then we have our MagSense start. Again, pretty self-explanatory. This just brings up the component, starts clocking it, and starts scanning some of the widgets or prepares the widgets to be scanned. And then we actually do scan the widgets in the MagSense scan all widgets component or API call. And this one's pretty straightforward as well. Just scan every single widget we have available. We want to make sure any of them are active. So we jump into our for loop and we see if MagSense not busy equals equals MagSense is busy. That's the very first thing we're checking. So basically we want to see if a scan is done. So we checked before. Uh, we started a scan on all the widgets, then we jump into this for loop and we make sure that a scan is complete. If it is complete, we go ahead and grab the data from it, and that's the process all widgets function call. And then we want to be able to tune based off of our MagSense parameters and get some feedback from our scanned widgets. And we can get that feedback by syncing with the tuner. Again, uh, we do a lot of easy I2C setup for this. The very last thing you need to do to sync with the tuner is run tuner. That's a MagSense library function call. 
Then if any widget is active, you can add a custom task. This is where some application or some handling code would go right here. Maybe you want an LED to light up if someone's touching a MagSense button. So you would go ahead and write LED right in this uh, little blank space right here. And then we can't just let things go unhandled for the next loop, so we start the scan again at the end of each for loop. All right, and then we have the components set up on our top layer schematic. We also have our firmware written in the main.c file, although it's not quite built yet. So actually, let's go ahead and build that first and make sure any errors go away. And you can watch the output window down in the bottom of the PSOC creator screen as things get built. Um, first time, this takes a little bit as we do need to bring in and build all the libraries for our uh, components that we brought into our schematic. So the compiling process will take a little longer here. Um, but ultimately, it succeeded. And you can see we have no errors. And that little warning next to include project.h went away. So now we're ready to configure our pins. So to interface with any inductive sensing or sensor system, uh, you're going to have some I.O. pins that you need to use. In this case, our kit actually has labels for what the pins are, but we're not too concerned about those labels right now because uh, they're pretty straightforward. They're somewhat default pin configurations. But if you would like reference for your own design um, with a kit, Go ahead and take a look at the kit on the PCB itself. It has the silk screen saying uh, which pins are being used. So I know from experience that we're using pin 0, 0 for our RX line uh, for button 0. For our RX1, we're going to just go incrementally here. We're using 0, 1. Uh, for button 2, we're using 0, 2. And for proximity, we are using 0, 3. And it's easy as that. And actually, our LX buttons, our LX lines from each of the sensors were generated on the correct port and the correct pin. So it's easy. We don't have to do anything there. These, um, these are just hardware resources. We, we hold on to these pins for any use with, uh, if you use CapSense or MagSense. So we can go ahead and lock those to their default values. And then our easy I2C data lines, uh, again, if you have a different kit that you're building for, uh, you'll select the other pin options, but on this kit, our default pins are pin 10 and pin 11. So we'll go ahead and just lock those pins down. And that's pretty much everything we need to get started with inductive sensing. Again, we've got our main.c, we've got our top level schematic, we brought in our components, we set up our clocks through this tab right here, where the clock says 48 megahertz. And the last thing we just did is made sure all of our pins were hooked up correctly. So the very next step is going to be actually programming the kit. So in this case, I'll just plug it in. And we can go back and make sure that our program button is right here. Um, in this case, I'll go ahead and click it. And as it builds again and programs, you can watch the output in this output window down here. And if everything works just fine, you'll see no red notifications pop up, no errors, no mistakes. And this takes a moment every single time, but it should be relatively quick this time because we already built. Cool. So it looks like things programmed. We won't really know for sure because we don't have any uh, feedback from the kit itself. But we did enable the tuner. And so I will now demonstrate how to launch the tuner. So if you go into your top level schematic for the project, once again, that's under the Workspace Explorer project, MagSense 1 in this case, top design. You have your MagSense component. You're going to go ahead and right click that just the same way you did to open the data sheet. And you're going to select this launch tuner option down here. Go ahead and click on it. And you'll see it gets populated in the default view with whatever components and widgets you populated in the uh, MagSense component in your top schematic. So in this case, we have our three buttons and our one proximity sensor. We're going to go ahead and hit connect and start. And if you haven't done this before, when you hit connect on your kit, 
it will come up with um, a frequency configuration thing, and that uh, you need to just leave as the default settings. So it'll pop up and warn you like, hey, you need to configure your I2C configuration settings and your clock speed. Go ahead and leave those as default and just close the window. And then uh, you should be good to go because earlier on, if you remember, I opened up the Easy I2C component that we dropped in and I changed our transmission rate to 400K and our uh, sub address size to 16 bits. And those are the default values to sync with the tuner. So you should be good to go there. So back into the tuner, you'll see our widgets have populated correctly. We are connected. Uh, there's a stop option if we want to stop, but we don't. And we have this fun graph on the right. We also have a graph view and a way to measure SNR. This is pretty useful for your applications. For now, we're going to stick with the widget view. And we have our widget explorer. So each one of these widgets has a checkbox next to it. You can disable their view in the widget view by disabling the checkbox associated with each of the widgets. You also have this touch signal graph, which currently shows nothing. So at the moment, uh, it's blank. You can use these other checkboxes to bring those into your touch signal graph. I don't think we spent too much time tuning any of these. Uh, we left them all in auto-tune mode, which means they're probably not going to be perfectly sensitive. So they probably won't show up on the touch signal graph. But if we go over to the graph view, we can take a look. Let's take a look at button zero for now and see what the signal looks like when I apply a fairly light touch to it. That's actually pretty good. So you can see in there, uh, if I stop it right here, you can see we've got these two big peaks. I touched it twice. And as those peaks pass a particular threshold, you see the sensor status actually goes high. And that is shown in this status window down here. And that means that the sensor is considered active. Basically, if you're looking at your widget status window, as you're touching it and it goes to a value of 1, that means it's ready to be used in your application. The scan check in your main.c is going to come back as positive, and you'll be able to handle some data from the sensor. You'll also see that we have these two different colored lines in here. We have a blue line that is the button 0 RX 0 raw counts, as well as an orange line that is the button 0 RX 0 baseline. The blue line is basically the raw signal data that we're getting directly from our sensor. And this data can be used at any time in your main.c by accessing the raw counts value in the MagSense DSRAM structure. But the orange line is our baseline value. And so this is a filtered value that will stay roughly the same um, throughout the use of your component. And it will also auto-tune and readjust itself if there are slow changing signals. Um, say you left your, si your sensor outside and the temperature went from really cold to really hot throughout the day, your signal is actually going to gradually drift and to compensate for that, we have the baseline, which will auto-update with that drift and make sure that your sensor signal stays consistent, even in variability such as temperature. And um, we can configure most of these values through the component. If we jump back in here, you can see the baseline is actually the value that we need to get above before we go to our sensor signal. Uh, and if I jump to the widget view and press Start, if I press that button again, it goes not active until it is over a value of 100. And you know it is active when the widget button over here, this red guy, turns red. Otherwise, it will be green. So once again, I'll press that button, and you'll see it's green below 100 counts, and it's red above 100 counts. So we can change those parameters. Basically, the point at which that button went from being green to red is set in a parameter down here in the widget sensor parameters window of this tuner. And that is called the finger threshold. So for a button, you have just the finger threshold and the noise threshold. Anything in the, above the finger threshold will trigger the sensor is active. And anything above the noise threshold will just be gathered as raw counts that you can detect in firmware, but won't actually activate your um, sensor mode. 
So we know button zero is working just fine. Let's go ahead and make sure these other three are at least responding. So if I press here on the other one, yeah, we've got some signal there, but it's not going active. That's good. We've got a lot of signal on this button two right here. That's really good. And if I do this proximity sensor, I don't get any signal at all, and then it jumped high as soon as I brought the target away from it. So that one's going to be uh, a little bit of a tuning process, but that's actually a good thing. So let's go into our graph view again and hit start, and we're only looking at that last sensor now. So I'm bringing a target near it at the moment, and you can actually see that as I bring the target near it, the raw counts decrease. And then when I remove the target, they jump back up and the signal stays triggered. This means that we are, well, I'll explain more in depth in a bit, but basically that means we need to tune this sensor in a very particular way that the auto calibration algorithm did not quite pick up on. And occasionally this will happen. I'll show you some, or I'll explain some tricks to help remedy the situation if that ever uh, causes problems for you. So let's go back um, to our widget view. We'll worry about tuning that proximity sensor in just a moment. And let's go for that button one. And I think this was the, the one where if I pressed it kind of hard, it would go active. Yeah, if I press it, we'll get some signal, but it won't go active. So I have to press pretty hard to even get that signal to show up. So I'm pressing quite hard right now, and you're seeing some of the time the signal shows up, some of the time it doesn't. Um, basically, we need to improve the sensitivity of that. And we can do that all through this sense tuner right here without going back to the PSOC Creator project. And I'm going to go ahead and expand our widget sensor parameters. And we know we were dealing with button one there. So you can see the, the touch signal graph for button one. And then I can click back in the button. And we're going to go down to our widget sensor parameters to help improve the sensitivity of this. So the first thing we can change uh, to make our sensor more sensitive is the number of subconversions. And basically, during a particular sample window, you want more subconversions because those will add to the counts that go towards your sensor signal itself. So we right now have only 100 subconversions. That's not a whole lot. But you can see it's grayed out. That's not one of the parameters we're going to be able to change right now. So we'll go ahead and change that in the component in just a bit. But we can change things like thresholds. And we saw that I was getting about 50 counts of touch signal earlier. So maybe we should try changing our finger threshold to 50 counts so that that sensor will trigger on any sensor touch that gets us over that 50 count threshold. Um, our noise threshold is then way too close to our finger threshold. Basically, some touches might be detected as noise. So let's go ahead and just change that to you know 20. That'll make it more susceptible to noise, but it will also mean we get no false positives from noise becoming a finger touch. And we can go ahead and make those changes. Any changes will be marked in bold in the widget sensor parameters. You can go ahead and hit apply to project in the top of the sense tuner, and this will actually apply it to your project. And then we've applied it to the project. Now we need to read it back and apply it to our device. And you can just hit that to device button in the toolbar at the top. And you see our widget threshold parameters are now no longer bold. So that means they have been successfully applied without even going back into our PSOC creator project. We'll go ahead and start reading data again from that sensor. And you can see yeah, it goes active a lot earlier now. So right at that 50 range, we see button one turn red right here. And below 50, we see it go back to green. And that's perfect. That's exactly how we wanted that button to behave. Now, it still requires a good bit of force to activate that button. So how can we make it more sensitive? Well, I mentioned we can change this parameter right here, number of subconversions. And we'd want to increase it, because an increased number of subconversions means a higher raw count value on your sensor. So we'll stop the data stream. We're going to hit disconnect. And I will close the sense tuner now. 
and go back to our PSOC Creator workspace. In the workspace, we can go ahead and click our MagSense component again. You'll see a bunch of auto-tuned parameters pop up. These are the parameters that the tuning algorithm picked out for each of our coils. We can go ahead and select Merge All at the moment because we are just using auto-tune. In a moment, we'll be using a manual tuning process that is a little better. But for now, we don't really care too much about that. We know button one was the culprit here. We needed a lot more sensitivity out of him. So we'll go ahead and select advanced. We'll go into our ISX settings. Leave AutoCal enabled for now. We'll make sure our clock settings stay at 48 megahertz. And then we'll jump into the widget details. And button one again, that was the more problematic guy. And we can try, uh, let's try tripling our subconversions from 100 to 300 and see if that gives us more sensitivity. So again, you've changed it from the default value, so the value is bold. Then you select Apply. That applies it to the component in your project. Select OK to close the MagSense tuning window. And we'll need to program our new settings into the device. So go ahead and select Program again. We'll wait just a moment as that gets reprogrammed in there. And once it's done, you're just going to launch the, the tuner. All right. So we just finished programming. I'm going to right-click the MagSense component and select Launch Tuner again. As the tuner comes up, we know we, we don't care about button 2 so much, but we definitely care about button 1. That was the guy we just made changes to, or the sensor we just made changes to. And we're going to verify really quickly in the widget sensor parameters window uh, that our number of subconversions changed from 100 to 300, and it looks like it did. We've connected. We've pressed Play. And now we can go ahead and press it and see what happens. Oh yeah, much bigger. So now we're getting all the way up to 500 counts of signal on a touch. And it definitely activates a lot earlier, so we would probably now need to go in and reduce our thresh or increase our thresholds so we're not false triggering on noise because we've just increased the sensitivity so much. But that's okay, we've gotten the functionality we want out of it and it's tuned. Um, as you can see, the touch signal that I was picking up just went away. That's because the baseline updated to the new value. And that's good, that means everything's performing correctly. And so we're kind of done with just the simple button presses. With button presses, uh, it's really easy. You just need to set up your connection, set up your pins, set up your uh, clock frequency, and put some code in main.c. In the tuner, you can just go ahead and look at your signals as you're using them. If there are any issues with sensitivity, you can go back to your component, knock up the um, number of subconversions to a higher value. Doubling it or tripling it is often a good idea. There are some limitations to how high you can go, but for the moment, uh, it's worth going fairly high, high enough that you achieve a signal to noise ratio of 5 to 1. And I will show you how to use the SNR tool um, in the tuner in just a moment with the proximity sensor demonstration. So that's the end of the uh, buttons. And now we had that proximity sensor that was problematic. And I'm going to jump back into the schematic and kind of show you how to remedy that, as well as explain what exactly was going on with that particular sensor. So we'll jump back to the screen right now. And we're going to go into the sense tuner one more time. And I'm just going to remind you of what was going on. So we're looking at our proximity sensor data. You see it's sitting around at 1,700. Um, and once I grab a metal target and bring it close to the sensor, that's what I'm doing right now, you can actually see both the baseline and the raw counts decreasing. That's quite odd because when we were looking at the buttons before, they would increase on a touch. And that's more like the behavior we would like to see. So what, what was really going on there, basically, is that the inductive sensing system was looking at a frequency or checking for a change in amplitude of a particular frequency. And when we were looking at the high side of the frequency, the resonant frequency of our proximity sensor, um, and the metal target was brought towards it, the amplitude actually increased. So when you're looking for a difference in amplitude and you increase the signal amplitude you're looking at, the difference actually gets smaller or inverts to negative, 
which is what we just saw happen here. Um, so basically, if we jump back into our widget parameters, we have this one parameter called LX clock frequency. And typically, you would set this frequency close to the resonant frequency of your inductive sensing system. So this would be your LC tank oscillator or whatever um, oscillator you choose to design. For this case, uh, it's just a simple LC tank. And we're checking for the proximity sensor. So the, we've decided to check around 800 kilohertz. I have a suspicion that the 800 kilohertz frequency is actually too high for this system. So we're looking at the high side of the 800 kilohertz or the resonant frequency of that particular sensor. If we dock that down to about 500 kilohertz, we should be able to see the positive change that we're looking for. That actually means the signal, if you were looking at an LCR meter, an oscilloscope, or um, some sort of live signal analyzer like a spectrum analyzer or other SA, you would actually see the signal decrease in amplitude but increase in frequency. And what we're looking at is just the amplitude portion. So we want to see it decrease in amplitude to give us our positive signal. Uh, of course, right now there's no easy way for me to do that. So back in the tuner, uh, I guess this is really going to be the best way we have to demo this. But again, we've got that 800 kilohertz. Uh, we need to change it. It's grayed out in the tuner, so you can't just apply it back to your project or read it back to your advice. So we actually need to close the tuner, get back to our PSOC Creator workspace right here. Make sure you're in the right project and the right schematic. Double click your MagSense component again to launch your settings. Uh, we've already merged all of our settings, so I don't think it's too important to do that again. We'll hit cancel. And then in advanced ISX settings, we are going to disable this auto calibration. Real quick, while the auto calibration is still enabled, I will go to the widget details, and you can actually still change your LX clock frequency, and that's totally fine. Um, Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it enabled for now because I guess we can just change our LX clock frequency without changing the ISX settings. It is better to manually tune once you get to this level of tuning, but in this case, we will use the AutoCal for the modulator IDAC and change our LX clock frequency to, let's say, 500 kilohertz. So I just enter that in this parameter right here, select Apply, and OK. Go ahead and program that back into your device. And once that's done, we're going to launch the tuner again. And it looks like we just finished programming. Looks good. Right click, launch your tuner again. Connect, start. We're going to jump right over to the graph view, looking at our proximity sensor. Let's just validate that the changes we made got read into the hardware. So the actual LX clock frequency it selected was 516.13 kilohertz. This is because of a limitation of available clock dividers. We couldn't get right down to the 500 kilohertz, but we did get pretty close with 516. Uh, so once again, looking at our graph view, let's see what happens when I bring this inductive sensor uh, close to a metal target. Uh, you see we actually have the signal increasing quite drastically all the way up to about 8,000 counts. So it looks like things are good. We're now looking at the correct lower side of the resonant frequency for that coil, which means we're getting a change in amplitude that is positive. So our signal is also positive. And things should be pretty much good for the proximity sensor. That is pretty much all we can do right now for automatic tuning with the inductive sensing systems. Um, I'm going to demo over or change demos to a more complicated system. This one's pre-built, but it is covered in the lab manual in the second section, the rotary encoder section. This one is fully manually tuned, and we do cover the steps to properly manually tune a system in the lab manual as well at the end of the first lab. The second lab takes the application to a rotary coder, and that's what I'm going to show you the project for right now. 
So back to the screen, we're going to go ahead and close the sense tuner. I'm going to just minimize our MagSense 1 demo project, and I'm going to right click and set as active project on my other pre built project. This is for the rotary encoder. We'll close all but the rotary encoder schematic. Go ahead and save our old project first. And you can see it's, it's pretty much the same. We just have the easy I2C for the tuner, the MagSense component, obviously, for the MagSense, and we have a UART component as well. The UART just provides some more feedback, but uh, we're not going to be using that for this portion of the demo. What really matters here is when you jump into our MagSense configuration, we have a whole bunch of sensors. RE1, RE2, a bunch of sensors titled dummy, and a dial sensor. The dummy sensors are because the inductive sensing solution takes up a particular entire port before it uses the next one. In this case, we needed to use pins on port 3 as well as port 2. Um, so we needed to fill up the rest of port 2 with dummy sensors or uh, yeah, some other whatever you want to use uh, on that port before you could use the pins on port 3. In this case, you can disable those sensors. You still need to have those pins occupied before you can use the rest of the pins on the port. That's important to keep in mind when you're designing hardware so that you don't reduce the number of available IOs. So if you want to use uh, a bunch of sensors, try to keep them confined to port 2 before you want to use port 3 or whatever available ports MagSense is on for that part. In this case, we're going to take a look at RE2 and RE1. Those are the properly tuned and pretty important sensors for this one. So RE2, we'll look at the advanced settings, and if we look at our ISS settings tab here, you'll notice that enable cal auto calibration is disabled. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the, the box means for enable auto calibration. When enabled, we see that our IDAC values and best resonant frequency are within 10% of the target for the ISX widgets. Um, and that can be very useful if you're just getting started and you want a quick launch. But if you actually want to tune and get really, really sensitive signals that you can handle and manipulate in a much more precise way, we definitely recommend disabling your auto calibration. Um, and I'll show you what you need to do back on the screen here. So once you've disabled that, you are now responsible for setting your modulator IDAC value right here, as well as your LX clock frequency. So there's some guidelines for how to set these in the lab manual, and those can be found pretty easily if you, if you take a look at either our design guide, uh, the MagSense code example that is available with either of the inductive sensing kits, or with the lab manual that was brought today, or is available in your resources menu for this VTW. Uh, basically, for the LX frequency setting, you want to figure out what the resonant frequency of your LC tank oscillator system is and select a value a few kilohertz lower than your resonant frequency for your LX clock. Um, this way you are looking at the low side of your resonant frequency and as the amplitude of that signal decreases, you will get a positive magnet, mag sense signal. The modulator IDAC is the other one that you need to tune. This one basically controls the strength of the current that we are driving into your inductive coil. Um, and it might be you know, really, really high for larger coils that have more inherent resistance and really, really tiny for sensi more sensitive, smaller coil systems. Um, eventually, uh, this might be phased out if you come up with a, an auto-tuning system for your own system, uh, your own inductive sensing kit. But for this particular component, we're going to leave it at 14 uh, right here. So if you jump back in here, you'll see our, my modulator IDAC is actually set to 14. That was because I did a scan. I decided that whatever it chose, I believe the auto calibration chose around 15. I played around with it in the tuner and decided that it wasn't sensitive enough. So I brought it down to 14. That actually jumped the sensitivity quite a bit. It will change coil to coil what the optimal IDAC value should be. So it's worth playing around with it and figuring out what IDAC value is best for your particular system. And then back at the screen, you can see I've actually chosen 14 for RE2. And I'll click on RE1 in the other widget sensor list. And you'll see this one's actually 13. 
even though these are the same exact coil, um, there are tiny differences in manufacturing. Maybe they're like one's got a, a micrometer more of extra copper pour on it, a tiny little amount of a dent in the FR4. And so we needed to tune these slightly differently to achieve the same performance. In this case, a combination of 13 and 14 on the modulator IDAC did the job for me. Every other parameter stayed exactly the same. Um, and those are just what, what happened to work. Again, if you want more information on how to correctly tune these, please check out the inductive sensing design guide and definitely check out the lab manual included with the resources menu for this VTW. There's one last widget we have in our configuration here, and that is just this dial widget. This one I'm not actually using. Uh, these pins aren't populated and these values are just kind of randomly chosen. This is actually just to show, to enable the widget which shows um, rotational position for rotary encoders. And if you want to do something like this for your own code example, you will need to, or your own project, you will need to enable the uh, dial widget in your MagSense component. That can be added the same way you would add a button or a proximity sensor. Um, so go ahead and take a look at the rotary encoder design. That project is also included with the lab manual. But we will go back to the firmware side of things because this is where it maybe is a little more interesting than the other project. We actually have all this application handling code um, and a function that converts sensor signals from our two coils on the rotary encoder into positional values. So all of this code right here that I'm looking at just grabs the two most recent red values from our sensors and determines how it wants to convert those values into a position out of 360 degrees. And if we jump up, we can see that in the previously empty for loop, the one that was empty in our MagSense 1 project, I have a whole bunch of stuff going on here. So we grab the current position from that get position function. Then we actually point to our, um, this is our encoder dial widget. We want to assign it the current position that we grabbed. And then we update the sensor position and print it out through the UART. So this is an example of what application code might look like if you were handling a MagSense inductive system. And I can show you guys really quickly what this ends up looking like once it is all built. So I'll go ahead and just program this project into the kit. Let me help you out here, Brandon. All right, thanks, Michi. So we do need to connect the FPC cable from one end of the CY8C kit 148 to the coil kit before things can get working. The coil kit and the 148 kit are purpose-built with an FPC connector that is completely compatible between each of the devices. Um, this way you can really quickly get started with any of the sensors available on the 148 coil kit uh, when using the 148 baseboard or just the regular 148 inductive sensing kit. All right, once again, we'll just make sure that's pro programmed in there. So I just hit program over in the workspace. And then I'm going to be looking at the tuner one more time. So I right click the MagSense component, select launch tuner. And you can see we've got this large circular dial that shows up here. This one wasn't in the other code example because we didn't bring in this dial widget, and that dial widget is actually the one that updates and shows the position of the sensor. So I go ahead and connect, I'll hit start to sync our data stream with the EZI2C component, and then I will do a quick tune up on the dial, so you'll see it doesn't update the position for a bit, and that is because it has to sync. All right. So it looks like it didn't quite sync right there. 
Maybe one of the connections is not fully hooked up between the two kits. All right, so I just reset our inductive sensing kit, and now I'm going back to make sure that things sync up correctly with our dial. And here we go. So now I'm slowly turning our rotor encoder dial by hand, and you can see that the position is updating as I move the dial through the rotary encoder. And if you want to look at the graph view of what was going on there as well, you can always jump over and those are what our raw signals look like. So that is pretty much everything I had for the demo. We'll go ahead and bring Michi back on to sort of close out and get back to some more information about our Cypress kits. All right, thank you, Brendan. So again, this hands-on portion, you can find the PDF manuals on your center console. So if you're just joining or you're, getting, you're trying to catch up, uh, again, download that PDF file to, so you can follow along with the labs. Um, I'm going to move into some of the uh, roadmaps for our PSOC MCUs and also some of the uh, kits and also documentations so that you can get started and get going with our CapSense and MagSense technologies. So jumping into the roadmap, we have our CapSense and MagSense portfolio here. So on the far left side of things, we have our configurable CapSense devices. Uh, we call them our MBR3s. Uh, they stand for mechanical button replacements. And this is really just for your standard buttons and slider replacements, mechanical buttons and slider replacements. It's a pre-programmed part and is also register configurable via I2C or SPI. And we do provide a easy to use GUI called EasyClick for our MBR3 devices where you can actually make your PC the host and have EasyClick installed, and then you can directly access those registers, for example, for finger thresholds or your negative baseline thresholds and those kinds of things using our EasyClick tool. Um, here in the center, we do have our programmable CapSense devices. So these are our PSOC 4 MCUs that also have that programmable analog and digital resources. So yes, they do have our CapSense capacitive sensing technology, but in, in addition to that, you do get that programmability with our analog and our digital resources. So you can create custom analog front ends or you can create your own custom interfaces using our universal digital blocks. And then far on the right side, this is our MagSense uh, dedicated PSOC 4 MCUs today. It is our PSOC 4700 family. This is the device that Brendan just covered on our Pioneer kit and also through the labs that he just did. We are planning, uh, I mentioned our component earlier in the webinar, our Sensei component. The Sensei component will also be part of our PSOC 4700 family. So this is that component where you both get the access to CapSense and MagSense all on a single chip. In addition to our PSOC 4700, you do get some smarts in that chip. So there is an M0 Plus inside and also some standard digital and analog peripherals so you can do some integration if required. Moving on to our PSOC 6 portfolio. This is all our PSOC 6 devices today that support CapSense, and we are working to support MagSense in our PSOC 6 devices. The chip images you see in black here towards the center of the slide, these are all PSOC 6 MCUs that are, that are in production today. And then the chips to the left and to the right of all the production PSOC 6s today are chips that we are developing or are currently sampling as well. And the key differences here are just we are supporting and broadening our portfolio so that we, we can support some of the low-end applications all the way to the higher-end applications here. So things like flash, memory sizes, digital and analog resources, they become lesser to greater starting from the left all the way to the right. Um, we have, again, these are dual-core devices. So you have an ARM Cortex-M4 and an ARM Cortex-M0+. Plus, and these... These products also do provide you that security that we are focusing heavily on today. Now, how to get started. So we have several different types of Pioneer kits and prototyping kits on our PSOC 4 and our PSOC 6 families that I'd like to touch on uh, in these following slides. So going into our PSOC 4 development kits, we do have Pioneer kits, uh, low-cost Pioneer kits and prototyping kits 
where you can evaluate our CapSense and our MagSense. We do also have our expansion boards that do plug into some of our PSOC 4 Pioneer kits. So for example, I do have here one of our PSOC 4000S prototyping kits. And what this guy has is a 4000S that provides support for mutual capacitive sensing and uh, self-capacitive sensing. In addition to that, this is a Pioneer kit as well. So this is this this uh, is Arduino Uno compatible, so you can plug in different types of Arduino Uno shields. Um, so you get more flexibility and more exposed I.O. on this board with some sensors on there if you wanted to test some of the analog, internal analog in our PSOC MCUs and those kinds of things. Now moving on to our Pioneer kit for MagSense. So Brendan just went to cover this in his hands-on uh, portion of his, his presentation. So this is the, our uh, PSOC 4700 Pioneer kit. Um, again, here. So this is where you have the metal overlay with some sensor coils and the proximity inductive coil as well. Again, this is uh, all run on PSOC Creator IDE. So all, the, all of our CapSense parts, PSOC 4 parts and our PSOC 6 parts can run on a free download using our PSOC Creator IDE that has the Sense Tuner and the CapSense and MagSense components that Brendan showed you earlier in his hands-on lab. Uh, again, this is another expansion coil board that we have. So this actually plugs into the CYHC kit 148 or the MagSense kit. So as you can see here, there are some linear encoders, there are some rotary encoders and different shapes and sizes for these sensor coils. So a lot of uh, different types of sensor designs that you can actually evaluate when you plug it into our 148 kit. And again, all of these kits today, they're, they're on Mauser's website. So if you go and visit them, you can find our PSOC 4, you can find our PSOC 6 kits, both the Pioneer kits and our Prototype kits on Mauser.com. And they also do have the documentation and those kinds of things for each of these kits on how to get started, etc. Jumping into some of our PSOC 6 kits now. So these are a bit more... Uh, these are bigger kits that have a lot more features on them uh, in terms of external components and things like that. So we do have a couple here. This is our PSOC 6 BLE Pioneer kit. As you can see on the bottom uh, right side of the board, you will see that there's a couple of CapSense buttons and sliders where you can evaluate our CapSense technologies using our PSOC 6 chips. Um, there's also a lower cost prototyping kit on our PSOC 6 platform as well. Again, this also has supports for sliders and mutual capacitive buttons and self-capacitive buttons on this prototyping kit. Lastly, in terms of more enablement tools and references and links, here's a few links for downloading our free PSOC Creator IDE. This is where you will find our CapSense and MagSense component and the tuner tool that Brendan just went covered in his hands-on portion. Again, we have links here for our PSOC 4 and our PSOC 6 prototyping kits and Pioneer kits. These are links to Mauser. And finally, the key uh, thing I'd like to point out here is our Cypress developer community, or our CDC, where we have actual application engineers monitoring this community and answering all of your questions, whether it be general PSOC microcontroller questions or CapSense, MagSense specific questions. So again, if you do have questions that maybe some of our documentation cannot answer or doesn't cover, feel free to post a question on our communities and we will definitely have an application engineer answer those questions for you. In addition, we have links here for our product pages, for our PSOC 4 and our PSOC 6 MCUs, uh, links to specifically to our Cypress developer community on PSOC 4 and PSOC 6 MCUs and our Cypress sensing technologies, again, CapSense and MagSense. And finally, we do have references and links for key documentations. So data sheets for our PSOC 4 MCUs and PSOC 6 MCUs and design guides for CapSense and MagSense that cover and give you recommendations on how to design a sensor, whether it be inductive or capacitive. So we've covered a lot of topics today uh, in the presentation and also in the labs. So I'd like to move over to the Q&A. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask them in the Q&A chat box. Excellent. This is Bill Wong, Senior Content Director with Informa, and I'm going to be here helping out with uh, your Q&A. So a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in. As noted, if you'd like to submit a question, please type it into your question window on the side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. While you're answering our, your question, or excuse me, while we are answering your question, 
please complete the feedback form, which is located at the bottom of your screen. So uh, for our first question, what are some of the use cases for mutual capacitive sensing technology? Some of the use cases for mutual capacitive sensing, I would say uh, one of the key ones is touchscreens or ITO, indium tin oxide. So a lot of smartphones today use ITO and they use the mutual capacitive sensing and because it provides the multi-touch functionality. So things like if you need to sense more than two fingers, that's where mutual capacitive sensing would come into play specifically for ITO. In addition to that, if you have Sensors that are far away from the chip, meaning that it requires a longer trace. That, that means it's higher parasitic capacitances. So mutual capacitance is a good way to, to kind of compensate for that high CP. So that's another use case that you would use mutual capacitive sensing for. Okay. <clears throat> uh, what types of other materials can work with CapSense other than uh, the PCB FR4? So again, as I mentioned, things like ITO, indium tin oxide, we've, we've, uh, we've done things on PDOT films, um, metal mesh, uh, nanowire, uh, nano silver, those types of uh, conductive materials we have tried. So it's not all just copper based, but again, we can do ITO, we can do PDOT, metal mesh, uh, silver wire, those types of materials as well. Okay. Uh, can CapSense be used for a hover finger recognition? Um, yes, it can. So the unique thing about our CapSense is that I mentioned that we can do hybrid sensing, self-capacitive and mutual capacitive. So you can use either of those sensing methods to do hover detection. In addition to that, you can also try glove touches using uh, self-capacitive or mutual capacitive. So again, our PSOC 4 MCUs and our PSOC 6 MCUs with our CapSense technologies do provide that kind of flexibility to, for you to decide which technology or sensing technology you want to use to do hover or to do glove. Okay. Are there any kinds of metal that work better or worse for the MagSense applications? Uh, Brendan, I think I'm going to ask you to answer that one. Let me take that question as well. So things like uh, copper, aluminum, um, tin, those are kind of good materials for inductive sensing. But again, uh, things like you know ITO or things like the PDOT uh, films and things like that, those are not very good materials for inductive sensing. So again, just to be clear, uh, materials like copper, aluminum, those are very good for inductive sensing. Things like ITO, things like PDOT are not very good for inductive sensing. Okay. Um, here's another one along those lines, but what's the minimum overlay thickness for using MagSense? So that's it's an interesting question. So there really is no requirement, meaning that the important part is how much deflection you want within your system. So if, if the metal is too thin, you're going to have too much deflection. So that could saturate your sensitivity versus if the metal is too thick, it would not, you wouldn't get enough deflection. So again, it's really not about the thickness of the overlay, it's more about the, the, the deflection that you require. All right. Uh, can you use CapSense for gesture recognition or gesture controls? Uh, yes, you can. So CapSense, again, this is using self-capacitive sensing or mutual capacitive sensing. Um, again, imagine a kind of an ITO matrix or maybe trackpad matrix type of sensor. Um, you get some X, Y, and Z data, and then you can use that X, Y, and Z data to recognize gestures. So, you know, things like swiping left, swiping right, pan up, pan down, you know, double click, single click, um, rotate clockwise, rotate uh, anti-clockwise, those, those types of gestures, yes, you can do. And with our solutions, we do provide those uh, gesture libraries. So that's something that we can provide for you versus, you, uh, you know, you guys having to go out there and just creating your own gesture libraries. Okay. Uh, does Cypress provide any documentation on how to avoid, uh, avoid false touches? Um, yes. So in our design guides, which have been um, thoroughly um, reviewed for quality and all of those types of things, but in, our, in those design guides, we do provide some really specific steps 
and recommendations on how to prevent false touches, specifically with things like liquids. So if you do check out our design guides, you will find those details in there. And then if, if there's a more you know, specific question or maybe something that's not covered in that document, again, we do have our Cypress Developer Forum to ask more of those kind of detailed uh, nitty-gritty questions if needed. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, for those questions we didn't get to during this live webinar, we'll be in touch after the event. This concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank Mauser Electronics and Cypress for sponsoring today's event, and of course, to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.